Man, so good to see you again. If you have your Bible, go with me to John chapter 20. John chapter 20. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's in the New Testament. And uh, we're starting a four-week series today called, no, uh, called Walking with God. Walking with God. Over the next four weeks, we're going to look at, uh, today we're looking at knowing God. Next week, believing God. And then uh, listening to God. And then responding to God. I'm excited about where this uh, series is going to take us, and so I hope that you will go with us. Let me give you my main idea for today in this service. My main idea is this. The cross and the resurrection of Jesus make it possible for you to know God intimately and eternally. The cross and the resurrection of Jesus make it possible for you to know God intimately and eternally. And I want to be clear in my purposes today. For every man and every woman here today, I'm going to offer two specific invitations to you on this Easter Sunday. The first invitation I'm going to give you is, to, is an invitation for you to receive or to experience new life in a relationship with Jesus today. This invitation is for everyone in the room where you, whether you've grown up in church or this is your first time in church, this invitation is for people who may not feel like they fit in a setting like this. It's an invitation for people who may, not, who, who may feel like they're far from God because of your past or because of your present situation. It's an invitation for people who have felt maybe close to God at some point in your life, but that was a long time ago and things have happened since then. No matter where you are today, no matter, no matter where you are right now, no matter what you, where you find yourself at, I'm going to give you an invitation to come back to Jesus and to come back to church with no questions asked. This invitation is open to you because at Christ Community, we really believe this. We really believe people should come to faith in Jesus. We believe people should come to Jesus, come back to Jesus, come back to church. It doesn't matter your past, your present, your personality. Your politics, doesn't matter your age or ethnicity, this invitation is for you to receive new life in Jesus by either beginning or renewing a relationship with him. So if you have any questions about where you stand with Jesus today, I want to answer those for you. It's for the men, it's for the women here today, it's for the teenagers. The second invitation, I'm going to give you a chance to be baptized on the spot today. Baptism is the first thing followers of Jesus do. It's our going public celebration of new life in Jesus. It's not how we earn life with Jesus. It's not how we earn a relationship with God. It's how you publicly declare that you are not ashamed to be a follower of Jesus. And some of you have never done that. Some of you trusted Jesus a long time ago. Maybe you recently became a follower of Jesus. Or maybe today you will become a follower of Jesus. Whatever the story, our goal today is to help you take this important step. So today I'm going to give you the opportunity to step forward to be baptized today. I'm talking to others who have been baptized, and I'm talking to those who, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I know I'm talking to a lot of people who've already been baptized, but I also know I'm talking to others who have never been, been baptized for whatever reasons. And I'm going to show you that none of these reasons are valid. Today's the day for you to step forward in obedience to what God's calling you to do. You might say, well, I was baptized as a baby. Doesn't that count? Listen, we are so thankful for your parents that they saw faith as important when you were a child. And they expressed that faith on your behalf, in a sense. But every time we see baptism in the Bible, like every time... It is in response to your faith. It's a decision that people make after they trust in Jesus. They make it, not their parents. And so today, you have a chance to affirm personally what your parents wanted for you all those years ago that doesn't reject what they did, but affirm it. You'll be able to make a call today where you could say, Mom and Dad, you made a decision in hope that I would affirm Jesus. Well, today, I made that decision on Easter. What better day to take that step of obedience? Now, you may be saying, I don't want to get my clothes wet. It's Easter. I look fly in my suit and whatever. Listen, we have 
all the clothes you might need. We've thought about everything to make this possible, to make this step for you easy. We have a black t-shirt, we have black shorts. We've got all the things to help you, you know, get your hair back the way you like it. We got all the things to help you take this step of faith today. Two invitations I'm gonna give you in a little while. So let's read together John chapter 20 and see what the resurrection has to do with us today. Then I'm gonna give you the opportunity. John chapter 20, let's begin reading together in verse one, and we'll go to verse seven. John writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, this is known to be John, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter. I think Peter was a fullback here. And reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen clothes lying there. But he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went to the tomb. He saw the linen cloth lying there and the face cloth, the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloth, but folded up in a place by itself. This is the scene we're given in John. The first thing I want to highlight for you today is this. You have a story. And you know your story. Every person in this room has a story. I've got a story about Ronnie, about my life. I can tell you about my mom and my dad. I can tell you who they are. I can tell you about where I'm from, and how I was raised, things I was taught. I can, talk, I can talk to you about the culture that I grew up in that really formed me today and the man I am and how I lead my home and how I live. Those things matter. You have a story as well. and you know, Only you know your story, you and God that is. And you could tell me if we had a conversation, you could tell me about your parents, the mom you had or the dad you did or didn't have who was or wasn't there. You can talk to me about the pain of that, the frustration of that. Sometimes even as, as adults, sometimes we can look into our souls and still see little boys and little girls and feel the pain of the bad stories that we have. You can tell me about the good stories, the good moments, but you can also tell me about the bad moments, the awful ones that you can't seem to run away from. You can tell me about the freedoms you had, the town you grew up in, about your school, about your friendships, about your struggles and about your addictions. You could tell me about the first time you felt guilt and the first time you felt shame for sin, the things you said, the things you got caught doing, the things you did. You could tell me all sorts of information about all sorts of moments because they belong to you. They're your story. And they're not like the story of the person next to you. Your story matters to you and it also matters to God. Here's a question. In your past in your story, do you have a story about a moment in time where you personally came to know God? Like you came to a moment where you looked into the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus and said, I believe. A moment where you came to know God intimately and personally? I think a lot about, uh, think about where these disciples are here, Peter and John. And we're going to talk about Thomas here in a second. But these guys were around Jesus a lot. We don't know their full story. We pick up with them like early on when Jesus calls them to follow him in a relationship. He says, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. We don't know their story before then, but we know they willingly drop things and go with Jesus. And they're around Jesus. They're having all these conversations about Jesus along the way. And Jesus is telling them, hey, I'm going to the cross. I'm going to be killed. I'm going to be raised to life. And they, they struggle with this. I mean, they, th their story takes them all the way to the cross, and they watch Jesus die, and they're like, what just happened? They struggle believing the words of Jesus. John tells us that the disciples believe that Jesus came from God, and we see that in John 16. But here, we know they had a hard time wrapping their head around the truth of the resurrection, really believing the words of Jesus. But here they are rushing to the tomb, looking inside to see, the, to see the linens lying there, just like, just as if Jesus had been lying there and, 
It's almost like Jesus had just disappeared through the linens. That he wasn't there. And all of a sudden in this moment, their mind is rocked. Like, we know what he said. And what happens? Look at verse 8. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in. And he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. This is the moment. Like This is their moment. They did not believe it until they believed it. And at this moment, their whole life changed. They believed. These guys had all these spiritual conversations with Jesus. They were all around him, but here's the moment where their faith became real. They believed. You see, sometimes people are around Jesus before they come to believe him personally. They're around Jesus things. They're around Jesus people. But until they come to know him personally, they don't really believe. These disciples believe some things about Jesus. But it's not until right here that they believe his words were true about the resurrection. It's where it became real. And when they believe, their life changed. Their convictions changed. Their commitment changed. Everything changed because they personally believed his words. There's another story. If you fast forward down to verse 24 in John 20, some other things happen. John, Jesus appears to some other people. And then you get to verse 24 and you find Thomas. It says, now Thomas, one of the 12, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas says, My Lord and my God. This is Thomas. He's really close to Jesus before Jesus dies. And then after Jesus dies and he hears of the resurrection, he rejects it. There ain't no way the guy was raised. I know he said that, but I'm not believing it until I see it. I'm not believing Show me the proof. And he goes so specific. Like, I'm not, I listen, he could show up here, but until I touch his hands and look into them, I'm not believing. Maybe some of you are like that today. Notice what Jesus does here. Jesus gives him eight days, like eight long days of him to go about his life and go about his business. And eight days later, giving Thomas plenty of time to think about this. You think Thomas is expecting Jesus to show up, looking for it? Probably not. He's probably going about his life unassuming, just thinking these guys are crazy. And Jesus shows up and says, here, touch me, see me. And the biggest doubter, becomes a believer. I believe my Lord and my God. You see, sometimes people are unsure of Jesus because they haven't experienced him personally. They're unsure about the faith. They're unsure about things. They don't really believe even though they're sort of around. Maybe this is where some of you are today. Here because your family has you here, because your spouse wants you here, your kids want you here, or your friends want you here, or it's the one time you obviously feel obligated to come to church finally, because it's Easter. But you really don't believe. Like there's been no real life change in you that makes you want to be here. Well, today, maybe you're Thomas, and it's the eighth day for you. Real evidence of a guy who was a doubter like you who says, listen, guys, listen, girls, I have seen and I believe. And if Thomas's evidence doesn't make you believe, we have more evidence and over 500 people who saw Jesus alive. We have hope because the resurrection is real. Have you come to a place where you've looked into the death, and the resurrection of Jesus, and believed yourself personally, made this faith yours? If not, that story 
that maybe broken story, that maybe bad story that defines your life can be redeemed today if you would believe. You see, no matter who you are or where you've been or what you've done, you can know God in an intimate and eternal way through faith in Jesus. Anybody can know God. And so Thomas pushes us even deeper into this in verses 28 through 29. Look what he says in verse 28. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus says to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed. Here's my second point. You can know God. You know your story, but you can know God today. You can know him. Thomas confesses, you are my Lord and my God. And Jesus says, blessed are those who believe. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is John 17, verse 3, and it says, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. You see, John wants you to know that you can know God, that through Jesus Christ, you can know him. Knowing God and his, is the purpose of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. God sent his son, Jesus, so that we could be brought back into a relationship with him that was originally broken by our sin and our rebellion. That you can know the creator who made you. That you can know him intimately and know him eternally. But the way we know him is by belief. We must believe. Now, the English word know here is, in this verse is the, uh, is, is, is the Greek word gnosko. This word gnosko in this context means an experiential knowing, not simply an intellectual understanding of God or Jesus and the Bible. See, let me provide a couple of uh, maybe comparisons for us. Um, knowing God versus knowing about God. There is a difference in knowing God and knowing about God. Matthew 7, 21, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. See, some people think they know God because they pray a prayer, or they pray some, or they're just hopeful, but they don't really know him in his word. They don't know his character. They don't know what he asks of us. They don't know his the spirit that's alive in those who know him. They don't know his obedience. They don't follow his commands. See, there's an experiment, experiential transformation that takes place when we turn from our ways and submit to his ways. When we turn from our ways and believe in his way. That, his, that this gospel, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, is true when we believe it and surrender our lives to him, a spiritual transformation takes place. It's a spiritual transformation that brings new life and new desires to obey God and his word. See, knowing God is intimately, uh, is eternally better than knowing him, than just knowing facts about God. Let me say that again. Knowing God intimately is eternally better than just knowing about God factually. Literally, like eternally like when you know God, you get eternal life. You get forgiveness for all your sin. You get a relationship with him. You get the blessing and purposes of what he's called us to do in this life. And you can't get that from just knowing facts about God. Like he created things and he's good. And you pray to him sometimes. There's a difference in knowing God and knowing about God. But also there's a difference in belief and inherited belief. Belief and inherited belief. Believing the gospel is a decision you make, not something you get. You don't go to heaven because you grew up in a Christian environment where you went to church, read the Bible, prayed a prayer, and did some good things. If you are a man in here or a woman in here, I press this upon you. You don't get heaven because you prayed a prayer or went to church or read the Bible and did good things. People who grew up in Christian environments walk headlong into hell every day. The Christian faith isn't inherited, but chosen. That is, God works to awaken our heart to our need for him, and we choose to cry out in faith to confess Jesus as Lord. You must believe on your own volition. 
You must choose Jesus, and when you believe, you get new life. And this is the good news of the resurrection, that life is available for all those who believe in him, not by works. doesn't matter how much you pray or how much money you give or how good you are. It's only by faith in Christ. Both of these examples speak to the difference in salvation and inoculation. Right, let me talk about inoculation. It's a big word. There's a lot of talk about vaccines these days. The purpose of a vaccine is to inoculate you with uh, enough of it to make you immune to the virus. We get the point of a vaccine. Satan works really hard to make people think they're saved, but in reality, they are not. There are many so-called Christians, particularly in the American South, who look like a Jesus the Bible never speaks of. Pray a prayer, live your life, don't worry about telling people about him, Live your comfy, cozy, apathetic life. Die and you'll get heaven. That is not the Jesus of the Bible. Like Satan has worked really hard to convince a lot of people that you're safe, that you're okay, you have nothing to worry about because that one moment you talk to your pastor. Jesus says, follow me, and oh, by the way, you need to love me above all earthly things, possessions and money and everything. Jesus says, follow me. It means the world will hate you and you will not have a home or life. No matter what culture says, don't give in. Stand strong. Jesus says, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. You will care about my gospel. You will care about my father's purposes. You will care about delivering this gospel to the end of the age. You will care. Your life will align to my father's word and what he's given us. Follow me. My kingdom is not of this world, but of a better kingdom. See, following Jesus means we get a relationship with God whereby we submit to his rule and his commands and his reign in our life. It means that we die to our desires and come under his authority and submit our lives to him. Have you submitted your life to God? Every area? Have you submitted your marriage? Have you submitted your money? Has he, have you submitted your sin? Have you submitted your life to God? See, conversion to Christianity happens in a moment in time, not just something you grew up in, but in a place where you, in your own volition, say, oh God, I see that I'm a sinner. I'm in need of, of salvation. I turn from my ways and believe by faith in your son. This is how we're called to know God, through Jesus. The invitation is for you to come to know him personally, which leads me to number three, you can have new life. This is the best part about the resurrection. You can have new life today. Verse 30 and 31 of John 20 says, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written, and here's the purpose of the writing, so that you, the reader, us today in this room, may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Those who believe Jesus is the only answer for their sin problem and confess him as Lord gain this new life. This relationship begins when, by grace, we are awakened from the state of spiritual death into which everyone is born. We're all born sinners. We're born broken. This is why my, you know, you don't have to teach your kids to sin. They just came that way. You know, they came selfish. They came fighting for themselves. You don't believe me? Many of you in your marriages, you know, we get, you get an argument, you still tend to defend yourself because deep down we worship ourselves. It's the way we're born. We're born in a state of spiritual darkness, in a state of spiritual death. But when we receive the eternal life Jesus offers to those who trust in him for salvation is when we get new life. The first part is recognizing and turning from our sin. That's called repentance. That's the Bible word, to repent from our sin. And the second part of trusting in Jesus and his atoning death on the cross for our forgiveness is faith. Knowing God personally, intimately, and eternally means to repent from our sin the way we're going and to trust him by faith. Repentance and faith. And in so doing, we are made right with God, fully forgiven of our past sin, present sin, and future sin. I gave my life to Jesus when I was 12 years old, and at that moment, I was completely forgiven Past sin, present sin, future sin. 
All of it wiped away. God sees me today through the blood of his son who's washed away all my guilt, all my shame, and he is standing in my place for my sin. And I don't deserve that. And it changes how I worship. It changes how I live because I have life in Jesus. Do you have life in Jesus? Do you have this life Jesus gives? It, it's not did you profess Jesus once, but do you possess Jesus now? See, if we know God through his son Jesus, then our lives will align with his commands. Our lives will reflect the work of God in us if we do indeed belong to him. One of the texts that consistently provokes me and convicts me is Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, 5, 19 through 25 says, the works of the flesh, just evaluate your life here. The works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God, but the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the one who knows me, his life, her life, the fruit of this Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Do you know that fruit in your life? Is there, if, if I were to interview your spouse or your children or your parents, let me ask you, is there, are these things in your daughter's life or son's life or spouse's life or parent's life? Would they say, yes, he is a man who knows Jesus or she is a woman who's been changed by Jesus? Or would they say, there's not much different with them. Those who belong to Jesus give evidence of the Holy Spirit's work. Do you have this evidence of life change? If not, today you can know God. And here's how, by receiving Christ. You can know him by receiving. You must receive Jesus. John 1, 12 says, as many as received Jesus, to them he gave the right to become children of God even to those who believe in his name. This means you are not a child of God until you choose to receive Jesus. You've got to choose, I believe by faith, not of my own works. This is why it says you receive Christ through faith, Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. By grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourself. You can't give enough, you can't pray enough, you can't go enough, you can't do enough. Only by faith in Jesus. Does God save us? This not of yourselves, it says. It is the gift of God. Gifts are free, not as a result of works that no one should boast. It's a free gift God offers you today to believe and receive new life. Have you made Jesus the Savior and Lord of your life? Some of you have been coming to church for a long time. Some of you have been sitting in seats like this for a long time. And every time you do, you just feel this conviction. You feel the sweatiness. And you just feel like someone's just like knocking. And the reason you don't come is because you hate feeling it, because you don't want to give up. You don't want to give in. You don't want to respond. But the Bible says in Revelation 3.20 that that knock is Jesus, because he loves you. And though you're stubborn, he's after you, and you can't run from him. Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him. Do you hear him today? Knocking on your door, Asking you to let him in. Asking, hey, I want to change you. Hey, I want to save you. Hey, I want to use you. Hey, I want to move in you. Hey, I want to fix your marriage. Hey, I want to fix your life. Hey, I want to fix your problems. But you got to trust me. You got to surrender. You got to come to me. I told you on the onset of the day sermon that I was going to give you two invitations today. And so here they are. Invitation number one is for you to receive new life in Jesus. A new identity with eternal security. This might be your first time in church or you might have grown up in church or maybe you've even called yourself a Christian. But truth be told, if you were to stand before God right now, just you and him, if your life ended today and you stood before him, it would be clear that Jesus is not your life. 
I want you to hear this as clearly as I can say it and as kindly as I can say it. Being a good person who goes to church, asks Jesus into their hearts, and gets dunked in the baptism pool does not make you a Christian. How do you become a Christian? Not by asking Jesus into your heart. You're going to have a hard time finding that language in the Bible. Not one time in the Bible is it there. Now, I'm not disparaging it. I get that sometimes we can use prayer as a mechanism to declare our trust in Jesus. But how do you become a Christian? By recognizing your sin and your brokenness and your need for a Savior and by declaring your dependence and your trust on Jesus as your hope for salvation. And by doing so, he transfers his righteousness for your brokenness and your disobedience. Now, you can do that in a prayer. The caution is in the American South, it's really hard. My friend Micah said this. The problem is we have mixed two quasi-bad theologies in the South. Walk an aisle, shake a pastor's hand, ask Jesus into your heart, and then once you're saved, you're always saved. And we've convinced all sorts of people in the Bible Belt to claim a Jesus that they don't know. We live in Charlotte where almost everyone you ask think they're Christian. Hey, you're, where do you go to church? Ah, man. That church up there on the, you know, where, where, where is it? I forgot where it's at. Who's your pastor? I don't know. He's, uh, I watch him on TV sometimes. That's, a, that's, not a, that's not what the Bible says. My gut tells me there might be a few people in this room who fit this category. Is Jesus your life today? Is he your life? For many, you have all kinds of excuses for not making Jesus your life. You say, well, I've still got questions. Great. I can help you answer those questions today. We can answer those today for you. We'll do our best. Let's start the conversation right now. You, you say, hey, listen, the, the church has too many hypocrites. That's why I don't go. Like, are you for real? Like, the, uh, this argument only happens when it comes to the church. I'm sure the medical field has many hypocrites too. But you're not out there going, hey, doc, I don't know if I trust you. A lot of hypocrites in here. No, you take the medicine because <laughs> you're sick. And there's a lot of people sick here in sin. And the only remedy is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the one who wants to save you. And I'm thankful that Jesus lives, loves hypocrites too because you and I have had a lot of our own hypocritical moments. You might say, maybe I'll just do this later. I want to warn you as humbly as I can that there may not be a later. You might lose your life today. Yesterday, people lost their life. Friday, people lost their life, and you may lose your life. You could die on your way home today, and this opportunity in this moment would be forever gone. Even if you live many more uh, years in this life, you need to be concerned about hardening your heart uh, towards God today. To hear the voice of God's Spirit speaking to you like He is right now, and you harden your heart only uh, against it only to perhaps never come back to this moment again, I say to some of you, this could be your last opportunity. Today's the day. Don't make excuses. Today's excuses are tomorrow's regrets. The first invitation is for you on Easter Sunday, 2020, April 4th, to receive new life in Jesus today. The second invitation is for you to be baptized today. And I want to be clear, baptism and salvation are not the same thing. Baptism is a public declaration of a personal decision to trust Jesus. You decide to follow Jesus as Savior of your life, and baptism is a going public of that decision. And again, people make all kinds of excuses here. You might say, I'm not ready. The truth is, if you've trusted in Jesus, then you are ready. But I don't have a certain level of Bible knowledge, and I haven't got it all figured out yet. At what point are you actually going to have it all figured out? I don't even have it all figured out. What matters is, have you trusted Jesus? And if so, then let's be baptized. People say baptism isn't really that important. It's not going to make a difference whether I do this or, or not. My response is, listen, are you serious? Like Jesus' first command to you, the first thing he says is to be baptized. And if you're not willing to obey his first command, what makes you think you're going to be willing to obey the rest? Maybe you're a believer today and you're going, I just, God's not so close and I can't figure it out, but yet you've never been baptized, maybe because you didn't obey the first time. Why don't you get it in order? 
You might say, well, it's really inconvenient for me to do this today. I mean, this reason or that reason, it would be really inconvenient. Honestly, if you're saying that, like, you don't get Christianity at all and you shouldn't be baptized. Christianity is about following Jesus no matter what. Jesus says to follow him means to take up your cross and die. The disciples we read about today all end up losing their life for following Jesus. Don't you think that was inconvenient for them? Even today, Christians across the world were, will die honoring and obeying Jesus in hard places. And your excuse is, it's inconvenient because I don't really want to get wet today. I want to encourage you in, in a humble fashion to, be, to declare your life publicly by being baptized. Again, you might say, well, I was baptized as a baby. I talked about this earlier. Your baptism as a baby was a profession of someone else's faith, not your own faith, and praise God for that. We are grateful for your parents or whoever's faith, but today is the day to profess your faith, for you to do it. And you have a chance today not to reject what they did, but to affirm what they wanted for your life. Well, you might say, I, gotta, I, you know, I don't have a change of clothes, so we have everything you possibly need, T-shirts, towels, shorts, everything. Our staff team's even on hand to fix your hair the way you want it. It's great. Listen, today's the day. You might say, I, I came with family and friends and we have lunch plans. They will wait. If God is working in your life and you're responding, they will wait. Are you ashamed to be identified with Jesus? If not, let's respond. If not, step forward and in faith. Today is a defining day, a day for you to do what God is telling you to do or a day to do what God has been telling you to do, to stand up from your seat and say, I want new life in Jesus or I am publicly ready to declare my faith in him on this resurrection day. Two invitations, it's time to respond. So let me invite you across this room and in our sanctuary to bow your head and close your eyes and just focus in for a moment. Every eye closed just between you and God I want to ask you first and foremost, right where you're sitting, is Jesus your life? Some of you don't have to think long about that. Is Jesus your life? 